Hey folks, my name is Jessica Mashkovich and this is One Take with Jess. My guest today is Dr. Ritu Kular. She is a, um, a pediatrician in Colts Neck, New Jersey. And I'm so, so glad to have you on today. I, there are so many questions that we all have with kids and health and their, their mental health, their physical health, should they be in school? I mean, I can rattle on for the first 10 minutes just asking all of the questions, but yeah. that's why you're here today to give us answers to some of these, hopefully, uh, you know, questions that are plaguing parents' minds. So welcome. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jess, for inviting me. No, I, I um, I'm so happy to be here. I'm happy to answer these questions because these are common questions that I get asked regularly. I have parents calling me in. There, there's a lot of anxiety around what's going on with the virus and how to handle it. And now that people are mingling and getting out, um, there's a lot more positive cases. What, what exactly is the protocol? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be on here. So that way, you know, we can get the word out to parents and families and kind of lessen the anxiety a little bit. That's great. That's excellent. And I guess um, my first question is probably related to, I, it's like probably because I have to choose between all of mine <laughs> and I might interject like a part A and part B in there too. But um, when kids were, were going back to school, I guess my, my thought is what is your take as a medical professional right off the bat in terms of their social well-being, their mental well-being, their physical well-being? Um, when decisions are made, which, what direction would you go in? Head into. So basically, um, I would say most professionals will have a different take on this question, um, depending on their experiences and um, you know, you know, and and what they feel is important to them. With me, I feel that social and development. Um, is very important for children. I saw a lot of kids over the past few months from March, April onwards to the end of summer and beginning of September really regress a lot um, developmentally, socially. Um, I saw a really high rise in patients who are teenagers with depression and anxiety um, because of the fact that they're indoors, they're not able to see their friends, they're not able to play their sports, they're not able to go out and um, discuss things with you know, family members or cousins and things like that. So I feel like that is very superior. I, I feel like there's a big mind-body um, you know, uh, combination that has to be looked at that's very important. So I, I do feel that that has to be given priority because if, if a lot of kids are gonna regress, a lot of kids are gonna have developmental issues because of not having that socialization aspect, um, then, then I think it's, it's, it's uh, unfortunate. I do like the fact that the kids are going back to school. They're doing it in a very, um, they're doing it in, in a very uh, careful way as far as monitoring the cases that they are having. And if that's the case, then they, they do close down the schools because of that. They're keeping the hygiene as good as possible. Um, but, you know, but they're allowing them to be kids as well. You know, there's only so much that we can keep the kids at home um, and right. educate them at home. I know a lot of parents have had trouble with that as well, too, along with a lot of kids. Yeah. Is there a certain age range that you would say going back into the classroom is better for? Is it the, um, you know, the eighth through 12th graders are definitely more beneficial to go to the in-person physical and maybe the younger, the younger kids are, should not be so quick to maybe go back to daycare and preschool and I, I think to answer that question, all kids in all age ranges are going to benefit from going back to some degree, um, however the parents see fit, to go to whether daycare, preschool, high school, grade school. I have not seen any, um, any child say, I don't want to go back to school or have mm -hmm. had any major health issues from going back to school. I've seen kids who have stalled on their speech, who have been toddlers, and since they've gone back, um, since September till now, they have done phenomenal. They, and the parents are, 
they're, they're so emotional. They're in tears of how well their toddlers have done just going back to daycare. Yes, they do get sick. They do get colds. They do get coughs. The kids have been indoors, so their immune system is weakened. They have not been exposed to any germs, so now they are getting exposed to germs. And that's how you make your immune system stronger. If we stay in a bubble and we stay germ-free all the time, that's going to be very difficult to build their immune system. So I think they're benefiting. The, the middle-aged kids and the high school kids are benefiting because they're learning better. A lot of them were not, you know, depending on whether the child has different deficiencies in education or learning, whether they have attention deficit or whether they're on the spectrum or whether, whether they have a reading uh, or an auditory processing issue. Those kids are really suffering at home. So with, with parents, who are have to work and manage the child, they're really not making any kind of progress. So they're doing wonderful and speaking to them on their checkups because now we're having a lot of annual physicals and well checks come into the office lately. They've been, they've been doing wonderful. They love the fact that they love the days that they're going to school. They're learning better that way. I don't think I've had a child say they're not learning when they go to school. Yeah, I, I definitely. So there's there's the time where you have to weigh what the risk is versus the reward. Versus, and right. The the risk health wise. Can you talk a little bit about the, yeah. the health risk of going back to school and also if the masks have have prevented actually people from coming down with the common cold, things that yeah. normally start walking into your office around yeah. this time. So I do feel the masks have helped in that sense of reducing the amount of viruses. There's a lot of kids who around this time, of course, flu season has started. There's whooping cough as well. And there's many other common viruses around this time that are spread airborne or respiratory. And so we have seen a big reduction of those viruses because you know either the ch half, you know, children are hybrid or a lot of the kids are home or they're wearing masks and their hygiene is very good. So I would say a lot of the visits that I'm having in the office are mainly well checks. Very few are kids that are getting sick from respiratory issues or anything of that sort. Mm -hmm. Their hygiene has been really good. So a lot of the kids now know that to wash their hands. They're being very good with that when they go to the school. I think the teachers and the staff are being very good with alerting the kids and making sure they're also taking responsibility of cleaning things and washing their hands as well and properly with, with you know doing it for 20 seconds with soap and water. And that's the best way to do it versus any other way. Way. It's um, funny because as parents, we try and teach our kids those fundamental skills from day one, and yet it takes peer pressure from a nation in oh, order yeah. to get our kids to comply with. Oh yeah, they're hygiene. gonna be. This is gonna be the uh, the cleanest. Um, <laughs> pediatric generation ever that we've had, which is, which is really good for our kids, you know, in, in the sense of getting, you know, um, illnesses and viruses and common, common viruses. So it's been really good for that purpose. Um, so yeah, so I believe the masks have been really helpful with, with containing a lot of other viruses for the seasonal changes. The hand washing has been phenomenal, but also when they get home, a lot of the kids are taking off their clothes and they're taking showers. They're taking immune boosters now. So a lot of parents are making sure they're on vitamins. Um, they're eating properly. I mean, that's a really big change that's happened you know, if you, if I compare last year to this year with, with, with the kids, um, health and immune system. Yeah. And, and that raises a couple of things. First of all, it, do you have to take off your clothes and wash them when you come home? Is that a good practice just for every day of existence? It's like you take off your school clothes and then you put on a whole new set of clean clothes to wash away the cooties of the day. So I would say that's a good practice, you know, regardless. And I, I always did that with my son when he used to go to daycare. And then even now when he comes home from school, we go straight up. We, you know, take a shower, we wash our hands, we brush our teeth, and mm -hmm. we do saline rinses. I think it's just a good practice to kind of, you know, we've been around so many germs, so many viruses and everything like that. Before we start doing our regular routine, we start eating food and munching from the cabinet and we start, you know, doing other things that we need to do. It's really good to kind of clean out all those germs that we came from. Same, same thing with us too, right? So if I come from the office, how many germs have I been around all day long? The first thing I do is I go straight up and I take off my clothes and I take a shower, wash that. So I would say it's, it's very similar for, for me and for them. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's good to know. Yeah. Um, since March, 
Yeah. What percentage of COVID cases have you seen come in or, you know, just statistics nationwide of kids, you know, getting COVID? I know symptoms in July started showing differently with COVID toes and little other manifestations aside from the adult respiratory form. Um, yeah. There was a whole, what's it called? Multi-system. Uh, right. So we're, exactly. So yeah. as far as those zebras that um, can be caused from, you know, coronavirus and you can get particular kinds of rashes that can give you inflammatory <laughs> issues and conditions throughout the body. Um, it's okay. Then I have not had any kids and my colleagues have not had any kids um, with, with those sorts of symptoms, which is really good. But we have had a lot of positive cases, especially now on a daily basis. I do get calls that, you know, oh, he tested positive, she tested positive. And they are getting tested because they were either exposed to somebody who they knew who had it, mm -hmm. a parent who was positive because of it. Um, and then they would get the child tested and the child would turn out positive as well, too. So, so were I've they, been, um, excuse me one second. I'm sorry. Were sure. they... Um, sure. Well, I was eating the cat food. <laughs> Just keeping it real over here. Um, <laughs> were, were these kids a, oh, I lost your video. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> were these kids um, asymptomatic at the time? You just, you just got a phone call or they weren't in the office at all? So I, would say, I, I would say half the kids that are turning positive that I hear about, that the parents call me about are asymptomatic. So it's just by chance that the parent was positive or the parent was exposed to somebody or their babysitter was positive, but the child has no symptoms, mm -hmm. no fevers, no respiratory issues. So I would say more than half are asymptomatic. And then the other half that I'm having are maybe having a fever for a day or two. Um, I haven't had anyone with respiratory compromise or respiratory conditions um, in the sense that they're having breathing difficulties because of it or that they're having inflammatory condition where they've been having enzymes from the kidney that are elevated or they're having any cardiac issues or they're having any rashes related to it. So those are the inflammatory conditions that can happen from the virus. I have not seen that, but I have seen a fever for a day or two. I have not seen it to be as bad as I've seen flu cases for pediatrics. So when I do see flu cases, I've, I've, seen them, uh, I've seen those cases to be more severe comparing to last year. So I've seen that the fevers are very high, the asthma, there's a lot of asthma exacerbation. There's a lot of body aches. There's, you know, um, kids who are very lethargic. They're not able to walk from it. That's the flu cases that I saw last year. So in comparison, and I'm going to say knock on wood, I hope it stays like this. I have not had a patient population affected with coronavirus that's been, too, that's been that bad. Okay. Well, that, that's yeah. great. I'm glad yeah. to hear that. But um, so on a national level, though, I'm sure you have your finger on the pulse of what is going on with children nationwide. Just, yeah. you know, so, so you know what might be coming, you know, in yeah. terms of other types of symptoms or other types of extreme cases. Yes. Um, yes. What, what has the country been seeing? Like as far as kids going with uh, testing positive or really exhibiting s symptoms versus being asymptomatic, are teenagers more likely to exhibit sy symptoms? And what's the whole breakup? What's the demographic of the whole COVID thing? Like when we talk about, oh, another 7,000 cases today or uh, 10,000 cases, what's, your, what's gonna be the breakup of the breakdown of that? Because we know that much in the beginning, it was the elder population. And now I think it's starting to skew lower in age. So what, right. What can you so we, us? so I would, I would say, um, you know, as far as the teenagers, the young adults who are becoming positive, a lot of them have been the asymptomatic ones that I've been seeing as far as, and, 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 and that's why they've been going about in the summertime, you saw a lot of people at the beach, there, a, lot of, a lot of kids were out and about not wearing masks and things like that. Um, so the ones that I saw related to, you know, teenagers and young adults, and especially the ones I've heard about 
as well in basic population, those are the ones who have been asymptomatic. The ones who have had fevers and symptoms have been the younger pediatric population. Mm. And because of their immune system, their immune system is weaker, it's newer, it hasn't had exposure to so many other viruses, to so many other germs. So they are ones that tend to have more of the symptoms and concerns than the older population. Now, the ones that we worry about are the ones that are asthmatic, you know, the ones that do have some medical health conditions. So we have some patients who have nephrotic syndrome or the ones who have um, certain cardiac um, concerns and uh, cardiac illnesses that we have to be careful from. Um, families that have been affected, as you probably heard about Brooklyn schools being closed mm -hmm. because there was high incidences in those areas. Of course, Lakewood has been an issue too. Um, that, with that said, you know, it also depends on the socioeconomic class. It depends on the amount, you know, as far, and the reason for that is because how often are those are those families going to doctors and how easy is it for them to get tested or get seen by a doctor? Mm -hmm. um, do they even know that they have medical conditions um, you know, that, they, that could predispose them to a much more severe case? So just for example, I had a pediatric patient who we just diagnosed who had a um, cholesterol of 350, mm. you know, and they were a very young patient and they had other concerns as well too. There was some- And that's um, a hereditary thing at that point. Right? That's a her hereditary thing. And there was also concerns about rheumatoid arthritis or arthritis in the family. So there was some markers that are positive for that. Mm -hmm. Until unless you don't do blood work, you don't go to the physician often, how would you know that a child has something of that sort? They, they appeared completely fine on physical examination, vitals were fine, no concerns. So a lot of it has to be that how, which populations are making it to the physicians? How good are they with getting their routine blood work done? How good are they with taking care if they are asthmatic with being on controller or maintenance medications? So a lot of factors depend on that and, you know, the, mm -hmm. the belief of, you know, getting, health maintenance on a yearly basis. And that, that's what's really important. Yes. Is that a function of, I know it, it is socioeconomic. Is it also a function of just health insurance and coverage? And I know that health insurance normally gives you like one health visit a year, but other than that, it, it's really cost prohibitive to go to the doctor, even if you think you might have something. So Absolutely. There's some, there's some insurances that have extremely high deductibles. So they have to think fine. twice. Yeah, they have to think twice. Do I really want to go or do we want to watch it at home? And how long do we watch it at home for? Is it going to be too late before we go to the doctor? What if something happens? You know, there's so many thoughts that come across a parent's mind before they come to the doctor and I hear this all the time that can you waive the copay since we've come three days in a row? Do we have to, you know, um, pay the deductible of this amount? And it's sad to hear that, that parents have to think twice, you know, before coming to the doctor or before yeah. they want to come to the doctor. So it, yeah, that's, that's a big, uh, big decision. Uh, and it's a big cause sometimes for, for, for patients getting into trouble because of that. Yes, absolutely. I think that is one of the biggest holdbacks to people yeah. getting the proper care. Right. And, and not only that, yep. now parents are working and now, you know, whether it's a single parent or a double parent, you know, if a parent has to go get them tested, they have to spend time at a doctor's office, that's time. And, you know, whether it's going to be two hours, three hours of your time, that, that's also a concern as well. If you have a single parent who has to take their child for testing or has to take them for blood work or has to take them for concern for a fever, they may want to wait because they say, okay, I have to go to work. Otherwise, how am I going to pay my bills? Right. So that, that does become a concern as well too. So having these things a little bit more readily available to families of this nature, whether it's in a school setting or having somebody who comes to houses regularly, I mean, that's something that we as a nation should think um, to make it easier for families. 
are, are you going to do that? Are you going to change over um, your practice <laughs> to doing house calls? Or you know, talk to me about oh. telemed, and then you could tell me about your new house call venture. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you, I actually started, when I started three years ago, I actually started with house calls. So I did start doing house calls. The problem is that the reimbursement uh, sometimes is just not um, feasible um, for maintaining a practice. So that's one of the biggest things that even if you go for house calls, it's so rewarding, it's wonderful, the patients, it's wonderful for the patients, but a lot of patients just can't afford that rate for that house call. And the doctors have to make a certain rate to be able to pay for their malpractice and to be able to pay for their, their health insurances, to pay for their payroll. Yeah, you know, pay for your doctor school. You went to, to pay a lot of for, school. To pay for our hundreds and thousands of dollars we pay right. in loan for medical, medical education, school, you know, yeah. and and that's what that's what the thing is. So so maybe that they will be developing something where they um, have lesser cost or lesser college education amounts that they're charging for tuition. So that way, more and more students are willing to do fields like this because otherwise there's going to be a shortage in primary care. Yeah, I mean that whole college reason. education and what they charge puts me on a whole different podcast topic. Oh you yeah, and no. Yeah, my Facebook yeah. page. I, I post like all <laughs> these articles. I've been like fighting the whole cost of education for the longest time. But meanwhile, yeah. my son goes to Penn State, and we pay through the nose. And I'm I'm living all of the things that I I fight against that I rail against. against. But yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But as so, far as that. Uh, and as far as telemedicine, your, your second question, yeah. that has been a godsend for, for everybody, for patients, for even physicians, because it's, they're able to discuss a lot of simpler conditions over, um, you know, we can kind of FaceTime and we can say, okay, there's a rash or for, for babies, there's a diaper rash. And okay, so this is what cream we're going to be deciding to give instead of bringing the child into the office, exposing them to the germs that, you know, whatever they would be exposed to in the office. It's been wonderful in that sense for a lot of families. Um, and for us to be able to do something like that um, and be able to implement that in our schedule it also has been wonderful. Yeah, I think that's great. And I really thought yeah. that that was going to catch on and carry on. But yeah. it seems that a lot of physicians are just turning away from the telemed. I don't know if yeah. it's because, again, the insurance doesn't pay out as well or yes. they, can't, they can't bill for, you know, a swab that was uh, stuck down the throat. I mean, it's, it starts to get into the, the whole commitment on the side of doctors on, on, yes. your, on your side of the field to, to say, you know what, we're going to sacrifice in terms of our billings in order just to, you know, maybe I can get 20 to 30 patients in on telemed yeah. per day. Um, so we'll try and make up for dollars lost on that end. But I, I do, I also feel it's extremely efficient and I thought we were certainly moving in that direction, but I feel like it's kind of stepped back from that. So yes, the reimbursement rate is much less than if a patient were to come to the office. So agreed on that part. So if I'm gonna see a patient for 10 minutes in the office versus I'm gonna to talk to them on the phone, I would rather see a patient in the office. First, it's, there's no comparison to seeing a, an actual patient looking in their ear, looking in their throat, diagnosing them by auscultating them versus doing uh, you know, a, a history over the, phone, over the phone. So you know, that difference is there. Reimbursement is an issue. The second thing is that you know, a lot of patients that uh, they want to say, okay, I have a fever, you know, what do you think it could be? That's very hard to tell over the phone. You know, there's only so much I can kind of tell you based on your history, but when you actually look at them, when you listen to them, look at their ears, I, it, the story turns out completely different. Right. I catch ear infections all the time that the child's not complaining about. We do a swab in the office. So for the strep, you know, they are like, wow, I wouldn't have expected that the child had strep. So the management is better in that sense that I'm not putting them on antibiotics that, you know, that are wrong for them because I'm going to put them on something that they really need and require based on their assessment. Yeah. Um, Just a, a little fun story. My daughter had a, a very large swollen lymph node at the top of her hip, like in that yes. area. Yeah. And when we were there for the doctor's office, the doctor was like, you know, can you please take off your shoe? I'm like, what? 
okay. <laughs> Turns out she had an infected toenail, like wow. a toenail, and that was the lymph node that was being put into action. Like, hey, there's an infection somewhere down there. You know, we're gonna we're gonna send the cavalry, yes. and that was the lymph node that was responding to it. Yeah. But yeah, she, she lanced it. It was like, kind of like that Dr. Pimple Popper thing. Like <laughs> her, the toe was completely disgusting. And we're like, wow, we didn't even, didn't even know it. to relate it. Yeah. Yes. I thought she was going to have to have like a sonogram or whatever of that whole pelvic area. And it turns out that it was just a toenail issue. Yeah. And that's, uh, and that's very but much the... caught it if it was telemed. Exactly. And, and that's, that's, so there's pros and cons to both. You know, I would say if there's simpler sick visits like a rash or, you know, something that you want to refill, a medication you want to refill, but the child is doing well, or they want to talk about toddler behavior, because I get a lot of telemedicine calls about, you know, potty training or how do we get them to sleep better? Or how do I get my baby to feed better? You know, things like that are definitely a okay for doing telemedicine and, and, you know, but there are certain things that for younger adults, for teenagers, older kids, you want to see them in the office. And, and, and for that, we will tell them that, you know, this is something I can't do over telemedicine. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, that's good. So um, how about vaccinations? I know during the pandemic, people were missing their visits uh, yeah. for vaccinations. And I believe the measles is actually a concern right now. That yep. if you miss your measles vaccination, we don't want the measles coming back. Right, right. And you know, I, a lot of people don't realize it, but when I did my um, residency and I was in Brooklyn for my last year, we see a lot of influx of people from different parts of the world who come into that area. There's a lot of different ethnicities and cultures in that area as well, too. I have seen all these related you know, people who've not vaccinated, who've ended up with meningitis or who've ended up with some chronic conditions that you just can't get out of your head and you've mm -hmm. seen them in the ICU with it. When, when we ask people here, they read, you know, what, whatever they read from Facebook and for so, from social media of, of not vaccinating and what reasoning they have, they bring that into the office. It's very difficult for a pediatrician to argue, you know, the case for 10, 15 minutes and tell them, okay, you know, these are the reasons we need it. This is what we need to do because they have not seen it. They have not, they don't see pictures of this. They don't understand what exactly, what effects can happen from not vaccinating your child. Obviously I tell them, you know, with the polio vaccine, you know, if we look at the early literature you used to see polio was pretty prevalent. Now you don't even hear about it you know, that's the vaccination that's worked. And that's why you don't hear about it. Right. Um, yeah, I so think maybe a little video, a little uh, three minute clip is in order for people who are anti-vaxxers or just oh, yeah. against vaccinating to show yeah. them footage of, you know, here's yeah. someone with polio, here's someone with smallpox and here's yeah. someone with measles and what the effects can happen from measles. Yes, because like a visual. At and, and you know what, they're relying on herd immunity, the fact that most people are vaccinated, so therefore if they choose their one child in the school not to be vaccinated, what's gonna happen from it? Mm -hmm. and, their, and their reasoning being is that there's so many preservatives and you know, they're not sure what chemicals are on, in these vaccines. I also tell them that if that's the case, then I'd be expecting you to making your own food in your backyard, right. raising your own chicken, having your own egg from the backyard, because you have, if, if you're going to go to that extent, you have to look at it in all dimensions. Why just for vaccines? Obviously, yeah. they're going to do it in a very careful um, way, studied way with evidence-based medicine. They're not going to just throw vaccines at children without any sort of research or evidence or studies. So yeah, we did have a lot of kids who just didn't come in for their visits. So of course, they're all behind on their vaccines or behind on their well checks. But middle of summer onward, it's been, it's been great in the sense that all the patients and parents have been coming in regularly. They've been getting their checkups done. They've been getting them vaccinated. They're coming in for extra visits just to get the kids vaccinated. So I feel like I have a great patient population around my area that um, does think that vaccination is important and make sure, and, and that's our office belief, by the way, too, that you know you have to be vaccinating your child um, and, and at least, 
you know, if, if you want to do it at a slower pace, but come in then more regularly, because mm -hmm. then we have to catch you up to that pace then. Right. You know, and, and, and that's very important. So we do educate the parents every time they come in. What are the risks? What are the benefits? We do give them sheets to discuss what's the importance of the vaccines and what are the side effects from the vaccines. Yep. Um, As, and, along and with the YouTube link <laughs> that you yeah. should really compile yeah. that video of the, you know, for the people that don't, here's what could happen. But. Vaccine, absolutely. I think that's a wonderful idea for for the parents that we somehow get in the office and 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 they don't stay in the practice because we do believe in vaccination. So yeah. um, unfortunately, they're they're not in the office anymore. But but that video would be fabulous to kind of put out there. So uh, the the COVID vaccine mm -hmm. may be right around the corner. And when I say right mm -hmm. around the corner, I mean spring of twenty twenty one. But um, they, they are testing. Um, I think Pfizer just recently got uh, approval for including children in their studies in, in the vaccine testing. Um, where do you see this vaccine coming in for kids? Uh, is it also the same time frame as adults? And I guess, will you be the first one to be taking it because you're a healthcare worker? Um, yeah, so how I- How do you feel I, about that? Yeah, so I expect, you know, with, with the vaccine for 2021, um, for it to be out for adults as well as for kids. Um, the only problem is that as far as what studies have come out regarding how many, how many patients have they tried this vaccine on, what side effects did they have to stop the study on, midway, what was the reason that they had to stop it? That I think has to be looked at a little bit further. Right. Um, as far as us getting the vaccine right away as soon as, as, soon as the vaccine is out, um, I don't know how comfortable I feel with doing the vaccine right away. Um, I feel like I need to understand the vaccine, I need to see, read a little bit more of the literature and if there's been any side effects to the vaccine before before taking the vaccine yeah. ourselves or giving it to our kids. Okay. So there'll be, there'll be a while before you are approving before it for we, your own body as well as it, before imp ex Exactly. Before implementing it in my office and taking it myself. Okay. But of course, How about doing the all therapeutics, the like any of the monoclonal antibodies or any of those types of therapeutics that they've been testing? And as far as using it in for pediatrics or in yes. in hospital medicine i know they've been using it a lot in hospital medicine so i've had colleagues who are pediatric hospitalists who have used that on pediatric patients um, they've been using decadron which is a steroid that they do give muscularly if the patient's having any sort of um, respiratory compromise or issues. So they've been having um, results with that. Um, remdesivir, that's the other antiviral that they've been using for patients who have tested positive that are being hospitalized, that are having issues recovering. Uh, as far as outpatient medicine in, in the office, we haven't used anything uh, so far and neither have my colleagues given any sort of um, prescriptions for this. It's just not readily available to this level yet. Um, but I do expect it to be out at some point next year. Um, just like we have for the flu, um, we have Tamiflu. It's been, you know, for some cases it is effective and for others it's not. It does shorten the course of the flu and the fever. So that way the patients recover a little bit easier and better. If that's the case, that, that I would love to implement as far as management if they have a an antiviral that's out for um patients to take next year yeah that's good yeah i agree with yeah. all of your sentiments yeah um so let's talk a little bit about the the social and psychological side of kids and covid and um you know, some of it might be within the kids' control or lack of control in their bodies. And some of it, it, it might just be parent exacerbated. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm a big believer that kids see what's going on mm -hmm. in, in the household. And when parents can be calm and collected and not crazy, yes. uh, kids really respond well to that. And I know a lot of parents, because once again, social media tells me so, <laughs> who have gone off the deep end and yeah. they're just so vocal. 
I can only imagine, you know, how vocal they are in their own household about yeah. just whether it's, you know, politics or <laughs> health or, you know, anything. Anything, um, yes. And, and how, like, you're a doctor, but your patients are, are the littles. How do you handle the parents when you obviously see that there's one that you just want to take by the head and go, <laughs> you want to be like, get yourself under control. You're ruining your kids. <laughs> yeah. And that's what it is. You know, with pediatrics, it's not just treating the patient. A lot of it is also managing and discussing things with the parents. So it's, it's dual therapy. Um, with the parents uh, related, I think your observation is very on point with the fact that when a parent or a family has high anxiety and um, a lot of fear and they come in with that and you can kind of sense that when they come in, the child obviously has a lot of that um, going on as well too. Um, so we do have to sit down, we do have to have a discussion with the family because I'll get regular or daily calls from parents as such asking me, this happened now, what do I do? Okay, next day, this happened, now what do I do? So I have to sit them down, I have to tell them, look, you know, we are in this situation, we're eventually all gonna have to get out of the house, we're eventually, all at one point going to get this virus as well too. There's only so much we can stay um, in a bubble. And, and we have to, the reason why I think they've kind of given us time is they want to stagger the cases that are positive. So not everybody's rushing to the urgent cares and the right. hospitals. Right. They have enough time to learn management. That whole flatten the curve just the to... Flat Exactly. And so we do have, we do as pediatricians have to talk to the family in a very direct way, but also in a compassionate way to kind of say, okay, you have to relax. You have to calm down. Otherwise it's going to, the effects are going to affect your child, you know, whether it's son or daughter, um, and it's going to be really hard on them. Um, and, and, and the, the patients that we have with the anxiety that are coming in or with the depression that are coming in, a lot of that stems from the parent. Um, so when we talk to the child, we also have to mention to the parent, why don't we go for a walk together as a family? Why don't we do certain yoga or meditation or Pilates exercises together as a family? Um, or why don't we look into kind of diet changes um, together? And maybe there's certain triggers that are causing this as well, too. So we, you know, when I, when I talk to the child, the parents there as well, too, and I'm talking to them collectively as a family of what they can do to kind of help in their day-to-day -day routine to help them through their anxiety. Yeah. Um, Are you able difficult. to ask those candid questions of the child? Like, are mommy and daddy fighting? Is mom drinking a lot? <laughs> um, so, is so that, yes. Does that cross the line? Yes, I, I am able to ask those questions when I do physical examinations or when I do consultations for any sort of mood disorder and I ask the parent to leave. I do ask a lot of personal questions to the child because I'm treating the child and the, what, what is affecting them, sometimes you have to get to the core of it. And with that, it has to be whether it's their boyfriend or girlfriend, or are they having any sort of intimacy issues, or are they having any medical problems that they can't tell their parent, or is it, if they're in a parental issue, we do have to talk about all those kinds of private things, and it does stay private. Mm -hmm. um, until unless it's a harm to the child or a harm to another individual, those are the only times I have to inform the parent that this is what was said, or this is what has to be done. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so we do have to have those discussions as well. And if I find that it is related to the family, then that has to be a separate discussion. Sometimes with the family, I have to mention, okay, you know, we need to get a family therapist involved. We, we should do this as a family rather than doing it as an indiv individual, um, because I can't come to the family, you know, it's not to me, my child's health is important. I do have to come advise the parent and the family to go for therapy, but I cannot go deeper with their concerns and their issues. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen a lot of kids putting on weight since the pandemic? Oh, yes. 
Yes, I would say majority of the kids have put on a lot of weight, sometimes 20 pounds, 30 pounds, mm. um, especially the kids, the, the older kids, the teenagers and the middle-aged kids mm -hmm. have put on a lot of weight. They used to do soccer, they used to do football, all these sports now, most of the kids were sitting at home. They didn't have anywhere to go either. And right. they were mostly doing a lot of boredom eating. So they had, you know, a lot of junk food at home. The parents are working. So they're not monitoring what they're putting in their mouth. And, you know, you're, you're eating half a bag of chips or you're eating a big one. One girl said to me, well, I'm just eating fruit, but she's eating big bowls of fruit you know, every hour, you know, but that also gets to be a lot too, because it should be portioned to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, so I have seen a lot of kids put on a lot of weight during this time. Yeah. Um, the good do thing you is- advise them? Do you give them a healthy eating plan as well as an yeah. exercise plan, something that they could walk away with and um, yeah. have as, you know, uh, kids thrive on schedule and rules. Yes. And some yes. people may argue differently, but if you have something like a printout that you walk away with, where right. here's a healthy so, eating plan and an exercise that I'm supposed to fill out, do you go yes. that far? Yeah. So we actually talk about dietary changes first, and then that's my first and foremost that's important because 80% of your weight issues are dietary. The 20% are exercise, right? So if we look at it that way, we have to first correct their dietary and then on another visit, maybe call them back for a weight check, maybe two months later, three months later, and then discuss whether they can implement more exercise. So we'll go down and say, okay, I want you to write a food diary. What exactly are you putting in your mouth? Write exactly that. We tell them the calorie counter so you can write down the calories on the side of that as well. And I make the parent accountable to do that as mm -hmm. well. So they come in with a week or two worth of that so that we understand what exactly they're doing or they can email it to me or they can call me and we can do a telemed and at least discuss it over the phone. And that way we can kind of go through it in that way. Then I, 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 with exercises, we always talk about very simple things. We don't, I don't ask them to do a hit exercise for 30 minutes and then you know, go do the treadmill, nothing like that. I just tell them go for a bike ride or go for a walk, brisk walk, put on your AirPods or music and just walk fast around your complex with mommy or daddy, with your brother or sister. And that way, if you could do that every day, that's a start. Mm -hmm. So if we just tell them small little goals, that's always the best way to kind of guide them versus telling them um, a lot of overambitious goals, which is great. But I think if we do it in smaller ways, it's, it's easier. So rather than we'll say, okay, you know, for snacking, let's do some meal prepping. Let's keep some yogurt. Let's keep some, you know, vegetables cut up in the fridge and let's keep it organized. So grab for that first, grab for water first, then wait a half an hour. So we'll kind of talk to them in that way. And it's not easy because pediatricians don't have time. It's a volume-based practice. You, we don't get paid for giving kids advice on this. If I code for dietary counseling, I get zero dollars. So, so that's another problem with the system. They even oh, yeah. going to Weight Watchers or getting any sort of help in, in this is not covered by insurance. It's not even yeah. like HSA qualifying dollars to or flex spend or whatever. No, but isn't that a problem? <laughs> That's a big problem. I, mean, so I love mental... what you're saying and all this yeah. advice you're giving, and it, yeah. it should be something that you can get compensated for, but also something that they can check back in with you and you become like their overall body health person. And I completely agree. And that's why I stopped doing group practice and private practice with multi-practitioners. And I said, hell with it. I'm going to do my own solo practice so I can spend however much time I want to spend with my families. Um, and I, and, and yeah, you don't get reimbursed for it. And that's why I, I got told by my ex bosses that you need to go quicker. You can't spend 30 minutes with each family and you know, you're not getting reimbursed for that much. And that there, there is something obviously very wrong with the system because if we start educating them on the diet, okay, before you come in for your wall chick, I want to 
list of your food so that way we can go over it. And then I want, you know, what exercises are you doing? We should talk a lot about mental health because that is becoming a huge concern. We do do depression, uh, teen depression questionnaires starting at the age of 11 on every checkup. So we do go over it, but I don't, again, I don't get reimbursed for it and I cannot go in depth with it because I only have so much time. And if I go on to do that, I will not have a practice left. Although all of my teenagers are checking off that they can't sleep. So sleep has been a big issue. Wow. All of them are checking off that they're, you know, at some scale, having anxiety, depression, palpitations, their mood is down. Um, and, and there's only one or two lines I can kind of tell them or tell the parent, okay, we need to see a therapist. I can't go much more beyond that. Even okay. that is a lot for me to do because otherwise, you know, I'm going to have two, three other families yelling at me, the Dr. Kular, you know, you have us waiting in here for an hour. What are you doing? Right. So right. It, it, are you able to refer them the, all the people that check off, can't sleep, can't do it. Are you able to refer them like quickly to a a partner or a psychologist, psychiatrist? So you know how many insurances are covering psychology and psychiatry visits? Not many. It's a lot of it is out of pocket. Mm -hmm. With really good private insurance, most families are not covered through their insurance for such sessions. So if you have to pay out of pocket, it's two to $300 per session right. that you're paying with a psychiatrist or a psychologist. If you are covered, fine, but you're going to get an appointment a month or at the most two months later because these psychologists and psychiatrists are so booked up. They are so busy that they don't have um, enough time to take on all these patients. Now, so a lot the of primary them, care physician um, provide um, prescription for uh, serotonin inhibitors, uptake inhibitors, or... Uh, we can... We can do very basic um, management for depression and anxiety, which I have done as well too. Uh, although the psychiatrist, if they have a, a extensive mood disorder, they have to be on several medications mm -hmm. for sleep or for another mood disorder. I'm not qualified for that. And mm -hmm. there's side effects to such medications. You want somebody who's three years more qualified than I am to make sure you're on the right medication and spending an hour with you talking just about this. So you would want to go to a specialist to talk about this. But as far as getting basic medication for depression and it being maintained on it, monitored, attention deficit, anxiety. I do do that. Yeah. So we do start them off on it, but if they're having trouble, we do have to refer them to the psychiatrist. Yeah. Is but there, it's not easy. Do you refer them also to a nutritionist? Is there someone that could pick up on where you left off in your just preliminary description of what a healthy eating and exercise regimen would be? Is there, yes. and, and are not, nutritionists covered? Not many, no. not many, and they're not many are covered. And a lot of them are paying out of pocket. Some parents went to Weight Watchers because they were that desperate because they couldn't get a hold of a nutritionist mm -hmm. that was covered. So now Weight Watchers had, has also done uh, kids and teenagers as well too. They have specific plans that, that include them. And if I give them a prescription with their BMI and a request, they do see those patients. And they've been, they've really worked with a lot of, a, a few of my patients uh, who've been teenage girls and they've done phenomenal. They've lost 30 pounds. They've gotten to the BMI that they wanted mm -hmm. and they're, they're grateful and thankful for something like it changed their life. That's and great. So this is a Weight Watchers program where if you mm -hmm. give a prescription to, yeah. they give it to Weight Watchers. So is that like a discounted rate? Or what it's what does a prescription get you? It, it allows for them to take them on as clients, even though they're not 18. They're, no, they're so you younger. Have to have a doctor recommendation doctor. or a doctor yes. prescription and Weight Watchers or Weight Watchers won't allow you to... That sounds like um, such an opportunity for Weight Watchers to carve that's a out. Great, a exactly. It's a, exactly. Thing for kids under eighteen. Exactly, and I think it's a wonderful opportunity because of the lack of nutritionists and the amount of mental health and confidence that these kids get just by improving their nutrition mm -hmm. and seeing the results. And you know, it's it's phenomenal. The the few families that I've referred that have lost that weight and done. They are still on a daily basis grateful and thankful that 
they got that referral and they went and they actually went through with it. the whole ent entire family lost weight That's actually. Great. So all of them lost weight together and they're, they couldn't be happier. So I so wish are you handing out prescriptions left and right to all of the people that do come in. Is that your first step is to no, no. My first step is that I try to manage it as best as I can. We go over the, just like we said earlier, I'll go mm -hmm. over, okay, bringing in a chart for me. Okay. Let's do this for your diet. Make these changes. You're eating pancake for breakfast. Let's do oats and mm -hmm. let's put a little fruits in it. Let's add this. They write that down and they kind of, uh, you know, I say, okay, come back in a month or two. I want to take your weight. I want to take your blood pressure. I want to see you walk every day for 30 minutes and let's see how you do. If they're struggling. So this family who I sent to We Watchers, they did not, they did not have any benefit from doing that after three months and no change was happening. She kept on gaining weight and I couldn't spend more time on it with mm -hmm. them reviewing it. So at that point we have to refer them because I'm not able to manage it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, there's um yeah. there's also just for your toolbox, there's also a couple of free apps that you can refer. I know Under Armour yes. has like it's called My Fitness Pal. Yes, we and, do. Yep, we do get the teenagers to put My Fitness Pal on it and they they love it. They're great with it. Not half of them will put, you know, their their food and what they're drinking, their water intake and their activity on it, half of them are lazy and mm -hmm. they don't have the time in the day to do it. So, so that's why I tell them, okay, fine. You don't even want to write it down, take a picture of it. And then that way I know what's the general gist of your breakfast. What's your lunch? What's your dinner? Right. And keep that with you when you come in, show it to me. So I know what, take the picture of the label so I can take a look at it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, then they have no excuse that, you know, I, I didn't, I forgot to put it in. I forgot to track it. And um, it, these sound like great tele tele doctor opportunities oh, yeah. at a discounted oh, yeah. rate. Not even like it's twenty dollars per call or whatever. Yeah. I'll coach you once a month, once yeah. a week, two weeks if you need it. But absolutely, yeah, no, no, not to that. worry about insurance or anything. That just sounds yeah. like someone who's who knows their stuff, like you, and yeah. just an opportunity to be, you know, a nutrition coach. Yeah, maybe. yeah. Um, but there's also, I know an, another product who's really going after Weight Watchers. It's called Noom, N-O-O-M, and they mm -hmm. do are some kind of online base. They try and coach you with, you know, diet, exercise, yes. like psychological, habit-breaking yes. techniques. And, yes. Uh, and they're, and they're, sorry, go ahead, finish. No, 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 no. I was just going to talk about potato chips and my love for sour cream and onion, but... <laughs> We all, we all have certain love like that. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, and that's what it is. A lot of, a lot of things are just healthy habits that a lot of kids just have to build on a regular basis, you know, whether electronics, sometimes you're just mindlessly looking at electronics and eating. Sometimes, you know, we have to talk about them putting the electronics down. Okay. Now it's time for you to sleep an hour or two before maybe read a book, you know, dust off those books and try to open a book and do it for fun. If not, listen to music and just kind of relax or get ready for the next day or, you know, something of that nature. So the sleep, because the sleep is lacking in a lot of kids, that itself is affecting a lot of the weight as well too. So a lot of it is just talking about healthy habits. And, you know, mm -hmm. when I talk about it, a lot of parents are like, yeah, you should do that. Yeah. I mean, they know it as well too. Sometimes when you're in that whole day-to-day -day routine, you have so much to do for work. You have so much to do from home. You know, it, you lose track. So it's good to kind of parents are afraid back. of their children nowadays. They, they do not want to enforce rules and, and guidelines in the house. Mm -hmm. It's just much less oh, yeah. trouble for the parent to sit yeah. down and just let the kid go off and do whatever the kid wants to do. I have, right. you know, my daughter's friends, some of them are not going to sleep till two in the morning. And mm -hmm. my first response is their parents let them do that. And I mm -hmm. mean, these are almost 17 year old kids, but some of them mm -hmm. have been doing it since they're 12. And mm -hmm. for me to have that reaction, like their parents are letting them do that is um, it's natural for me, but it just kind of shows me that parents just don't want to be bothered. And if a kid doesn't want to fall in line, well, then you got to kick it up a notch as a parent, which, you know, requires a little bit of parental energy, but right. It's a shame. Right. Exactly. 
Yeah, and I agree that, you know, and, and when I grew up and with my parents, they would just literally look at you. They would look at you <laughs> and you would drop what you're doing and listen to what they're saying. No questions asked, you know, same thing with things that were required of you, you know, your chores that needed to be done, um, your work that needed to be done. It was just much more simpler at that time. There's a lot more complexity now with parenting, with raising kids. Um, they see a lot with um, TV shows and, you know, how one family is supposed to act and they kind of think, okay, this is how things are supposed to be. But I think it's always the parent's role and duty to kind of you know, you're, you're, yes. yes. Parents need to step up. If yep. anyone gets anything yep. out of this podcast, it's take care of your health and exercise, yep. go see your doctor yep. and parents need to step up. Step up. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> uh, That's you know what? One, um, something that I was thinking about also with the, with the pandemic and COVID and people now working from home and doing remote schooling or playing a lot more video games. What are some secondary symptoms that you've seen come walking in like anybody having eye strain or posture has gotten worse because you're huddled over the computer or or your thumb joint is infected because you're playing too many video games not infected but inflamed i should say that's such a good question um so we already talked about one with one was weight because of not you know not moving not exercising basically the second is the with the vision we've seen a lot of kids get glasses or whether reading glasses um and they've been affected with the headaches and they've been getting the headaches because of the straining from you know looking at the computer screen all day a lot of kids have been getting these blue light glasses because they um, they're shown to kind of help with all the exposure of all the, with, with the emitting all the light from the computer to help them so they don't have sleep issues and they're not straining their eyes as much as they would if they weren't wearing their blue light glasses. So a lot of kids are getting more, the ones who are coming in, I'm recommending they go for eye checkups more regularly or if they haven't done already. And um, a lot of the optometrists are rec recommending the blue light glasses. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yes, because of that. So they're getting headaches, they're getting eye straining, insomnia. So sleep has been an issue because of all the blue light exposure that they've been having and they're, you know, constantly on the on mode. Um, so yeah, that has been an issue. And of course, yeah, neck pain, shoulder pain and neck pain and everything like that from kind of constantly sitting in that posture and position. So what's a good posture? Chest out? So that's back. very difficult to do, but yes, yeah, so chest out in a square way and just kind of sitting in that way. Computer your, up, at, your, up at eye level? At eye, yeah, play. exactly. Yeah, at so least lower than eye level, but at least a little bit higher so you're not scrunched down like that, a little, little bit higher than that. So, <laughs> you know, and it's difficult. I would say take regular breaks. You know, it's hard to kind of go straight take regular breaks, wash your eyes in between, make mm -hmm. sure you do some eye exercises. So you wanna, just like we do other exercises, you wanna raise your eye up and down, side to side, um, but washing it with cold water, walking around a little bit, doing stretches, you know, some very simple, and I wish some schools implemented this, doing simple yoga stretches that are really good for your back. They're really good for your neck. They're, they're good for your alignment as well, too. Mm -hmm. But for all the computer time that they're using, it would really help the kids out a lot as well. Yeah. And some like 10 push-ups, 10 sit-ups, yeah. oh, yeah. 20 squats, <laughs> just to get the blood flowing again. Yes. Sometimes I, if I'm sitting here, my fingers yep. will go numb, like my yep. feet, because there's no blood circulating. So, no. you know, I, I tell my kids also at college, when, when <clears throat> you're stressed or you're doing homework, take a right. break, do yep. 10 push-ups, yep. 20 squats, yes. stand on a wall for 30 seconds, and yep. then everything will start heating up. <laughs> yep. And that's absolutely right, because for individuals who have a familial or hereditary condition where they're more prone to blood clots, you have to move your legs. You yeah. have to move around a little bit. Same thing with people who are flying all the time, you know, you're more prone for blood clots. So it's, it's a similar deal that you have to implement some sort of activity or exercise or movement often 
yeah. whether it's every hour, or every two hour, maybe set a alarm or a timer that I'm going to get up and do jumping jacks and I'm going to do some sort of activity and, you know, move around a little bit. And that's, that's great because it kind of gives you a little boost of energy, you know, yeah. better than coffee. It, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Blood flowing to your brain helps you concentrate. I make things yep. up in my mind if it's not real science. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, what about what about drugs? We're going to talk about drugs now because I am. I, listen, I I know marijuana has its pros. It's good for a lot of medical purposes, which I'm I'm on board with. I you know I have friends who've had cancer, and marijuana mm -hmm. has definitely helped them. Mm -hmm. um, my mother has multiple sclerosis, and I'm like, mom, you just try and like smoke pot or eat something or do whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll take the but. I don't know what I'm recommending or why, mm -hmm. but where it really gets very concerning for me, not that it's not concerning at all times, is when it comes to children. Mm -hmm. And a lot of kids are, whether it's smoking it or vaping it or uh, edibles that they're able mm -hmm. to get their hands on, mm -hmm. it's extremely concerning. And mm -hmm. the pandemic has, you know, left kids to their own devices. And I've heard some horror stories where, you know, there's certain kids that have had psychotic breaks or, you know, it exacerbated a, an underlying psychological issue because of the THC and the, the psychotropic nature of, you know, of the marijuana itself. And it's very concerning to me. So what are your thoughts? Have you seen, um, you know, usage on the rise in younger and younger kids? And is there a, a real psychological concern when it comes to pot smoking? So I um, personally, uh, with my patients, have had a handful who, with teenage boys who have had an increased amount of usage throughout this year. They've gotten into issues and um, it's, it's led down a road where they're including other drugs as well too, not just marijuana. Then they get involved with um, uh, heroin and they get in, and involved with a lot of other medication drugs as well too. Marijuana is just a start from a leading point to other drugs as well. We so a gateway. Yep. Exactly. So we've had that issue happen this year. Um, I know when I'm walking around anywhere, whether I've gone places or I've walked around public places, all I smell now is marijuana. I don't know about you if you notice that, but wherever I go, whether I want on the I just boardwalk. Go to Tampa. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they're Which taken up in Tampa, too. but maybe. <laughs> So that's, that's a big, but yeah, you're there. right. You're right. I do. Yeah. I do smell it more often. It's, it's much more freer now. People feel much more freer to use it now compared to other times um, publicly. Um, they're using a lot of, um, like you said, edibles. So a lot of teenagers are getting a lot of edibles, um, which is accessible. It is eventually going to be an issue for that population. I do. I did have um, some kids who, whether they have cerebral palsy, one, one had um, horrible seizures that were, you know, um, protractable. So she would have seizures throughout the day and she would be on medicinal marijuana or we would have ones that are wheelchair bound and under a lot of pain who, who would take medicinal marijuana. So I've had kids like that. That helps. That's, the, and which that's helped, a wonderful which, thing which, about marijuana. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Which, which has made such a big difference in their lives. But now with it being easily accessible to our kids and, you know, now you're not sure when they go for school, are they going to be asked for these things? It's going to be much more readily available. How, how is life going to be for our kids, how do we prep them to prevent them from heading in that direction? Because I have had colleagues, and I've had I've known people who started off taking that you know uh, that drug, and although they say, "Oh no, it's nothing. It's just you know it's better than drinking. It takes the edge off," and you know there's it's really not a big deal. I've had parents tell me that. So if we've done drug testing mm -hmm. for a child because it was suspected from a school that the child was taking it, it turned up marijuana positive. I've had more than a dozen parents that's, oh my God, it's just marijuana. It's nothing else. That means, okay, that's okay. So we could deal with that. Mm -hmm. So it's also the attitude of a lot of adults, not just the kids where they're saying marijuana is not a problem. Right. They don't understand 
the implications of how it could lead to, like I was mentioning earlier, other drugs that can that could be an issue for a lot of kids. Yeah. Um, but also not having that focus or drive or passion, you know, in in whatever field that they're heading into. You know, I've seen a lot of kids um, in medical school start taking marijuana, and they're fantastic. They're very smart. It gave them focus focus for that time that they needed it. But eventually I didn't see them become doctors. I did not see them at that graduation mm -hmm. at the end because they eventually lose focus and they kind of yeah. drift then off. Does into it even give you a temporary focus? Like you just said, it gave them focus for the time they needed it. That, that would be Adderall. <laughs> That's the right. Drug. <laughs> but the, the right. marijuana, exactly what you said, the, the end result is that it, I believe, you know, and you completely come off of track of what you know yeah. of whatever you're trying to do in your life your passions in life but not only that there's other side effects as well you could have hair loss um, with men over time you get infertility you get gynecomastia which is you know you get um, male boobs so those are all the things that you can you know it's not pretty to look at if you were to take um, a high amount of marijuana so it's something something to think about in that sense but a lot of them just you know end up not being um, not being dedicated in their career or passion for life a lot of yeah. them kind of just fall off or drift off in another direction and kids taking this younger and younger, I, I always feel that their brains are a little bit more malleable. They're more influenceable. They're not fully formed. Um, how, how is this affecting brain development in, in children? And when I talk about children, I may picture age eight years old, but I also may picture age you know, 16 years old. And probably marijuana would have different effects for each of those two ages. Yeah, so you, you don't have much development after you start taking, it depends on how much you're taking too. So that kind of varies. So if it's like once a month that you're taking it and you're mm -hmm. taking it very rec recreationally, it's something that, okay, it's not going to have that much of an effect on a kid's development or their, um, you know, like you were saying, as far as their concentration, their focus, and as far as what they want to do in life. But if you're using it on a regular basis, which eventually you do come to that point that it starts off very infrequently, it becomes frequent along with other drugs come, it comes after that. It eventually leads, all leads to the same thing that we were talking about a lot of lack of focus um, and the development is just not going to be there. A lot of kids drop out of school, high school, the ones that are using a heavy amount of marijuana and drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen it myself. You know, most kids are not finishing high school if they're into uh, a heavy amount of marijuana um, yeah. that they're taking. So it really depends on the amount of how much they're taking, like how frequently they're taking it. Mm -hmm. And you know what, that's the, to me, that's a pro for legalizing it in the sense that, you know, eventually it'll be regulated where you would know the dosage, you know, of right. That you're taking. right now, you don't know if you're eating a half a gummy, a quarter of a gummy, three gummies. And I don't know if there's okay. such a thing as a marijuana overdose, but no. I know from, you know, certain people's experience, um, a friend <laughs> that, yeah. like, their heart pounds out of their chest from oh, yeah. THC, and that's the reaction that is con that consistently happens. So it's mm -hmm. it's not. And it's a really bad for people who have. You actually feel or mimic. Sometimes some people mimic anxiety symptoms. Mm -hmm. So what you're describing is their heart pounds so fast, they start sweating. They feel like their chest is tightening. Mm -hmm. You know, so there are some people who have symptoms of that sort. And how do you know how much is in a certain amount, whether like you said, a half a gummy or a lollipop, you know, in Manhattan, they have those lolly lollipop trucks all over right at nighttime. They do? Um, at midnight. <laughs> Brownie trucks. Again, lollipop. I only go to Sam's Club. I have no right, idea. Right in Times Square. Them. Yes. They have all of that readily available. And I've taken pictures of it and unbelievable that wow. there's no... Nobody's stopping them from dispensing this. Huh. But yeah, so they do have these things available, but there's no control on it. So hopefully with the control, at least you'll know how much, how much is in each amount that you're giving them. Yeah. But not everybody has the same response. 
What happens physiologically when someone is under the influence of marijuana in, in terms of their eyes? Why, do you, why can you look at someone and say, you're definitely stoned? I mean, there's a dilation of there's the pupils. A, right, there's a dilation of the pupils. You have kind of like a conjunctivitis look. So you have the redness of the sclera that's there. You always have this glaze or the this glossy. Look. What is yes. that? and a glossiness to their eyes. I'm not sure why, you know, that's, that's the drug or that's, that's causing that effect in them. I'm not sure why it causes that, but yeah, that is tell. so bizarre. Like it's yeah. not like your eyes are tearing or you've no. been crying. So there's like a watery look when that happens or a yeah. dry eye, there's a dry eye look, but that glazed aura is just something that I'm like, how does that even come to be? Yeah. So, yeah, and, and that's why you can tell right away because you know, from other cases, right? Allergies, you're going to have the tearing conjunctivitis. If it's infected, the, the person's going to be, their eyes are going to be very irritated right. and they're going to have discharge from it. But those people who take the, from the marijuana, they're not complaining of anything. They're not complaining of itching or burning or no right. discharge from the eyes, completely dilated eyes with the glossiness in it you can, you could tell pretty much. And plus you could smell them as well too. I mean, the smell is pretty strong that you could, yes. you could smell it on them right away for a while that, you know, that they have. Um, right. And that's it. if they're smoking it. So yes, yeah, so that's a dead giveaway for sure. Same with cigarettes. Right. That's a dead giveaway. Right. And the, right. the edible side of things or the vaping, yeah. sometimes those don't give off any sort of, you know, no. detection. Um, right. And, and right. actually that, brings me right into vaping how are, are, are you seeing vaping still going up in kids or is that has is that a fad that has just passed i'm hoping so we passed. ask this to all our teenage kids and we do discuss this and all of them tell me they're not vaping but i i, I don't i doubt it because i see it outside all the time when i go out i see a lot of kids vaping privately parties i hear about it as well too um so personally as far as discussing it with the patient i have not had anybody who's confronted me to say that yes they're vaping and hmm. this is how it makes them feel so a lot of them don't come forward with it but yeah the parties they all have it mm -hmm. the gatherings and everything they they do have it and it's very available to all of them wow I, you know i'm the first one i'm such a squealer i would go into um appointments with my kids and i would tell the doctor i'm like they're doing this <laughs> they're doing that <laughs> I'm like so, nobody's hiding anything from here i'll fill out the form on their behalf because i know what they're doing then they could recheck it like full so, closure and that's not typical a lot of there's a lot of denial from parents. So it's actually the opposite, I feel, from a lot of parents when I ask them, okay, you gained 40 pounds, you know, you must be eating some junk food or some food that's not right. Why don't you oh, tell no. me? No, no, he just eats fruits all day. He's eating vegetables. He's drinking water. He's so active. So it's hard for me to help a family like that because they're in constant denial. Yeah. And you're, that's the way you're telling me that you are is very different than you know, a lot of parents, a lot of moms are in a lot of denial about what the kids are doing and why they have certain conditions. And, and it's a shame and it's a shame. It definitely is yeah. a shame. Yeah. But um, with, with, with talking to the, with talking to the kids though, you know, it's important to talk with them with the parents there so they can kind of fill you in on their take, but it's also very important to talk to them separately mm -hmm. because sometimes they feel more comfortable talking to you. Not a lot of parents feel comfortable leaving the room. So I cannot get, so all this, you know, questions you're asking me about what they're doing on the side, a lot of parents don't want to leave the room. Oh, it's okay, he can tell me. He talks to me about everything, so we know everything. So they can't share to me, are they sexually active? Are they doing something they shouldn't? Is there something that they had a question about, you know, privately that they cannot talk with their parent? So it's very difficult sometimes to kind of get a lot of this information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What if there was like an online tool that the kids had prior to the appointment? I know that parents like are given the online access to fill out paperwork prior to getting there, but maybe the kid can have like anonymity and be a little bit more candid if they were to fill out an online form even before getting there. So mom wouldn't see it and only you and the kid would see it. 
You know, that's a fantastic idea. The only thing is, I have a feeling mom would be sitting right next to the child filling out the form. The same way with the forms that we ask them to do in the office, you know, we, we don't hand it to the parent. We hand it directly to the child who's sitting far away from the parent. Mm -hmm. But somehow the parent ends up right next to <laughs> the child to fill out the paperwork. Right. Um, the same thing with, with the email. The email that we're gonna send you is gonna go directly to the parent, not to the child. Mm -hmm. So the parent is most likely gonna quickly, half the time they will not fill it out because if we ask them to do forms, most of the times they haven't done any forms, so they're filling it out in the office anyway because they didn't get time, they're rushing, work went over, they had to pick up the kids from here and there. So those forms hardly ever get done to begin with, but it's a, it's a great thought. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a great idea though. Thank you. You know what, just to circle back to COVID before I let you go, yeah. um, kids that might be uh, sitting at the Thanksgiving table with family members, I don't know, you know, how many people are going to have family that they don't regularly interact with um, coming over. Are kids going to be a likely spreader uh, because they may have gone back to school and like, you know, for a small child, what's the viral load compared to an adult that might spread it? Yeah, so a lot of families, so a lot of families have been having birthday parties that have been very intimate. And that's a big deal for a kid to have a birthday party. And a lot of them have just been mom, dad, child, maybe a grandparent or an aunt and uncle. It's been very um, intimate as far as gatherings um, because of this reason that the child is going back to daycare and the grandparent do are immunocompromised or the child's going back to school and like I said earlier that most of the kids are asymptomatic so a lot of them will call in saying doc he's positive she you know she's positive but the child has absolutely no symptoms whatsoever. So how are we supposed to contain that and prevent that from spreading to a grandparent who has, you know, um, cancer or has some um, autoimmune condition? It's, it's very, very, very difficult. So it's a judgment call from the family, from the grandparent, from the aunt and uncle who have that specific condition, whether they feel comfortable mm -hmm. being in that environment. And it's more for their health more than the child. Because like I said, with pediatrics, I've had most kids, very few have had any symptoms, if any. It's mostly the older um, adults or middle-aged adults that if anything, you know, are, are having certain conditions. So, but even if you are a kid and even if you are asymptomatic, you can still you can spread, spread it. Spread it. Absolutely. 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 And you wouldn't even know that they, yeah. that they actually have it. Or how would you know that they were exposed to somebody with COVID a day before that dinner party? Right. You know, and, and then nobody knew that that exposure had happened. So it's a chance that we're all taking when we are around kids or in, in even other people who are working with um, a big population. I mean, I'm meeting um, mm -hmm. new families and kids and sick kids all the time. Yeah. So, you know, I'm very high risk. So a lot of people have to think twice before they would want to hang, you know, you. <laughs> hang out with me. <laughs> as cool as I am, but they have to think about it. But it's, it's definitely, you know, it, you have to do what you have to do. And you have to look at your own health and decide, yep. you know, how should I, what, what, what is proper for me to do it to maintain my health? Um, a lot of kids, on, a lot of babies are being born, by the way. So they're calling them, pregnant mommies are calling them coronials, right? Because it's been the coronavirus. So now we're going to have a lot weird, of coronials. A weird way, but yeah. 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 So with that, there's a lot of fear of what's going to happen to a lot of unborn children if they get exposed. So there's been a lot of, okay, my grandma, my mom wants to come over and see the baby. The baby was just born. Do I allow my mom to come over? There has been loads of questions with that. And I always tell them that, you know, the baby has no immune system at all. Mm -hmm. And right now having that exposure, whether it be around this time or another time, you really have to minimize the exposure of anybody yeah. um, except just yourself and your, your husband and your child. Um, if you have other siblings there, that's fine, but you have to really limit who the baby's gonna be around, at least for the first 
few months. Yeah, definitely. I saw a couple out and about with their child and the baby was not wearing a mask, of course, because it's really mm -hmm. hard to keep a mask on a baby. Mm -hmm. um, but I, in my mind, I was like, you really should be home. And that was mm -hmm. just my you know, judgment call on, on no evidence whatsoever. But have infants gotten Corona? Like, has it, what are they- no. What's so far, we have not had many. I mean, worldwide, um, there's been cases, of course, in the U.S., there's been a few cases of infants as well, too. But in our practice and my colleagues' practice, I haven't had any infants what because happened? the parents what have happened? been really careful. Get it? So they, they, they would obviously pass away. I mean, it would be very fatal for them if they were to get something like that. If just very similar to whooping cough as well, too similar to flu. If they were exposed to somebody with the flu or whooping cough, you know, or, or this. I don't know, know if people know that. Like, I don't know how well known that is. Cause I have yeah. seen like kids with, with the parents, with their kids, like very small yeah. children that really yeah. should not be. Oh yeah. We have some that are flying on airplanes. We just had somebody ask me if they're going to go to Aruba very soon. And they're, I think four month old. So we have people out and about and doing their thing. And you know, that's everybody, right. everybody has to know the pros and cons and yeah. make their decisions. You know, yeah. we can't force anybody, but as long as there's awareness and a lot of people understand what the risks are, mm -hmm. that's, that's what's important. Do you think kids are suffering from not having like facial interaction with people like because the masks limit your face? I mean, I have been so eyebrow expressive <laughs> with everyone I talk to. Like if it's someone I'm happy to see, I'm like, oh, yeah. just, just to make sure that the so reaction is we're, there. We're, we're all going to come out with very expressive eyes, wonderful eye makeup. Nobody's buying lipstick and very limited. Exactly. Our... <laughs> and anyone that has had bo Botox, Botox on their forehead, for the forehead. You're, you're done. You're out. There's no expression before, none now anyway. You know what? The younger kids, the ones who it's important for their speech, for them to see you talking, for, mm -hmm. you to, for them to see your lips, to see your movement, it's been hard on them because they're in that phase where they do need this part to kind of, for the parent to slow down or for even with teachers or other kids to slow down for them to understand because they kind of, they, they learn by watching others and they, they express by watching you express. So it's been tough on them. But other than that, once you're past that age and stage, I mean, yeah. um, it is what it is for a lot of kids. They, they're lacking, whether it's not just this part right here, they just, they're missing human touch and they're missing, you know, it's such a big thing. You know, if you just even get hugged at this around this time, how good does that feel just to have that touch, you know, right. that exposure. And, and a lot of kids are just missing that. Mm -hmm. um, the older ones. And, and, and that's what they really need. Everyone needs a good hug every now oh, and then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big hugger. So I, <laughs> sometimes, you know, I have to stop myself because sometimes I'll see parents that I've known for a while and I almost want to go and hug them. And I have to say, Oh my God, I can't do that anymore. Oh, it's such so. a, such a weird world. Do you yeah. think we'll just yeah. turn a corner and like maybe end of 2021 things will start going back or is this kind of we're going to look back three years from now and still be wearing masks and, and all. I think, yeah, I think by the end of 2021, this should all start tapering a little bit. There'll mm -hmm. be, like we talked about, that vaccine will be out. We'll kind of know what effects, if any, that's causing. We'll have better outpatient treatment for, for pediatric kids and adult patients. So that way we have that out as well too. There's a better understanding in the hospitals of how to treat patients. Now we know not to do too much fluid for patients like that because we're gonna cause more lung issues if we do that. So mm -hmm. the more and more cases happen, the more we understand how exactly to better manage these situations. And eventually, you know, we have to go back to normal life. We have to go back to hopefully how yeah, things were before, you know, even though we have a lot of infectious disease doctors and other doctors saying that this is going to be the new normal. And for a while, I, you know, I would hope that at some point we have to 
start leading our normal life because there's only so much you can wear a mask for, especially for people like us who are wearing a mask for eight, nine hours a day for other individuals as well. It's not, that's also not safe as well. That's also not healthy to Mm -hmm. be breathing out into your mask and breathing it right back in as well. Mm -hmm. So So fresh air breaks as well. When you're doing your push-ups, when you're doing this, you got to run outside. It's all got to be part of the alert that you set on your watch. You know, fresh air breaks. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you so much for spending all this time. I think we learned that healthy eating, taking your vitamins, exercise, practicing good, you know, maintenance, health maintenance. Yes. That, that, essentially, that essentially is where it all health starts from. If you eat right, you think right, you have healthy habits, you take care of your immune system, um, you eat fresh foods, less processed food, more healthier organic foods, if you, and, and exercise, those things are, are such a good healthy recipe for you know, success in life mentally, physically, um, and health wise. So that way you don't end up getting a lot of the viruses that you would get otherwise. Yes, definitely. And, and stay calm. You know, even if your parents are off the wall and you're a kid, <laughs> do your own form of yoga and shut off the social media Yeah. and, you know, just, you do- have to do a detox, a full detox. Sometimes you have to do that because otherwise, you know, it's hard to kind of just be refreshed. You just have to shut everything off. Social media, TV, you know, spend time just in nature, go out for walks. There's so much, so many great hiking trails in New Jersey that you can go to and go biking outside. There's so many fun things to do. And yeah, and your parents aren't always right. So when everyone looks up to their parents, a lot of times you can get the best knowledge from short TikTok videos (laughs) (laughs) on on how to raise yourself and, you know, be a better person. There really Mm -hmm. is. Even on social media, there's definitely a lot of like health and wellness. Good things as well too. Yeah. And that that whole idea with TikTok is that, you know, having fun and dancing, singing, and just being creative is not such a bad thing. Right. You know, it takes your mind off of, it takes your mind off of things. So if anything, you know, if you look at it in a positive way, it's not so bad. Definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate you being on with me and I hope that people have learned an awful lot. How could they not? (laughs) I hope so too. Thank you so much for inviting me. This was a pleasure. It really was. I'll talk to you soon again. Okay. All right. Take care. Nice seeing you. Bye. Bye.